Welcome to CounterPoint. I'm Tanya Granick allen We have a current issues panel with us today, a regular feature here on the show. And today we're gonna to be covering some interesting topics. Ontario's new lockdown measures, how lockdowns disproportionately impact lower income families, one business owner's version of the vaccine passport, or shall we call it the anti-passport, as well as the new O'Toole carbon tax. And of course, we must discuss the gaping hole that has been left since the passing of Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. Well, returning today to join in the discussion is conservative commentator, business owner and student Hannah solomon Vey, as well as Vani Sweetland, media commentator and nomination candidate for the Federal Conservative Party. Thank you both so very much for joining me. There's, as usual, way too much to discuss and so little time, so I think we should just delve right in. Uh, let's start, obviously, with um, probably the most impactful, emotionally, that is, news item, which was, of course, the passing of Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. You know, he had been the Queen's concert for so many years, that steady hand. And as we've recently seen through his funeral uh, with the COVID lockdown measures or the COVID re reduced uh, gathering measures, it was a very simple, but also very touching and beautiful funeral. Maybe I'll start with you, Vani. What does the passing of Prince Philip mean to you, mean to Canada? Yes, listen, it's a tremendous loss, not just for those in Great Britain, but for those of us here at home as well. We know that he's been a great ally to Canada over the years. And I also know that as I'm out and about speaking with people, everybody is extremely touched, you know. I think that speaks to his connection to Canada and to Canadians. When you have somebody who is not a national, but it's as if he was here every day. Like I was in Tim Hortons, you know, getting a coffee. I heard people talking about it. So people are solemn. People are upset. And, and rightfully so. Sorry, go ahead. I heard, I didn't get that last point. And rightfully so. And rightfully so. I agree. I agree. Hannah, there has been much discussion that there has been this void, this hole now left with his passing, that he was the steady hand. Uh, he was steadfast in his resolution. His, 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 he was the rock for the queen and who could fill that void now going forward and and that he was the last of perhaps an era that we may no longer see going forward what what are your thoughts yes i completely agree i feel very uh sorry for the queen right now this is a very difficult time for everybody but then you know to lose your spouse like that uh someone you've been close with for so long the uh, prince was beside her you know, aside for, for so many years, countless, countless years, most people have lost count of how many years uh, they were together. And uh, the Queen has been, you know, a loyal servant and, and he uh, served alongside her in such a meaningful way. And definitely not only, you know, have uh, has that relationship been lost now, but also just that role model of service. So I agree with Vani that a lot of people are mourning uh, his loss, but especially the Queen. And so my thoughts and prayers are definitely with her. Absolutely. And, you know, perhaps in his passing, you know, younger, the younger generation around the world might take note of, you know, how much he gave up to fulfill the role as, as the queen's consort, to, to a sacrifice so that he could be her right hand and, and steady rock. And, you know, I think there's an element of sacrifice that was done there that, you know, perhaps we don't see sometimes with, with some of the younger generation and perhaps they can say, oh, well, this might be a good role model. And, and you know, internationally, there's been such an outpouring of, of mourning that perhaps we could refocus the attention and, 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 and the model and the example uh, of Prince Philip for the younger generation to come. So our, again, our thoughts and prayers are with the royal family. Uh, moving on to more domestic matters, Ontario, again, one in three Canadians live in this populous province of Ontario. They've announced new measures. Doug Ford, the premier, announced extreme new measures, some compared it to even martial law, but then he backtracked a few days after. But let's start with those measures. Hannah, I'll give it to you first. You know, things like no playgrounds, no tennis, no golf. But I think what was most shocking is that there was a stay-at-home order, but that you could be randomly stopped by police. Uh, we have 45 seconds before commercial. Please give us your, your first thoughts and we'll pick it up again after. Yeah, it's just shocking. I'm so glad there was such a swift uh, pushback, and I'm so thankful that all of the local police forces said they would not be enforcing something like that. It was only the OPP that said they would. Uh, what sense does it make, like, shutting down playgrounds where little kids play? And, you know, Einstein said the defini definition of insanity is repeating the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. You know, lockdowns clearly don't work, so I'm not sure why Doug Ford keeps beating this dead horse over and over again. 
Yeah, it was quite surprising. And you did mention that there was some pushback, especially from parents when their children saw their playgrounds basically wrapped up in caution tape. And they said, how could we do this? You know, the weather's warming up. Kids want to be outside. We can't keep them cooped up inside. Well, we're going to pick up this conversation right when we return. Welcome back. We're picking up right where we left off before the break, discussing the new lockdown measures in Ontario, including some that have been clawed back. So let's talk about some of those clawbacks. Initially, uh, the Premier of Ontario, Doug Ford, suggested there would be no access to playgrounds. There is no golfing, no tennis, which, in my opinion, are, are very socially distant, naturally socially distant sports. So I was kind of surprised to see that on, on the list. But remember, schools had just been locked down. So kids are at home. Their parents are working from home. They're doing online schooling. The parks and playgrounds are closed. The Ford government said you should have an excuse to be outside of your home. And what must, might have been most shocking is that the police could stop you randomly and ask you what the purpose is of you not being at home is. And uh, you're right, Hannah. There was a swift reaction from many police departments. Um, Vonnie, did any of this uh, random stopping of the police, this, this potential policy, did any of this sh uh, surprise you or did you have any concerns by it? Yes, absolutely. I think right now, at a time when we've seen most of the world under a lot of civil unrest due to police brutality, a measure like this was toned up, in my opinion. However, I just want to point out the fact that everything comes back to procurement. We haven't had the ability to secure enough vaccines in Ontario. So we see a provincial government that is scrambling, scrambling to A, create a solution to this very catastrophic problem and B, find a way to get people safe. And the truth is the only way they can do that is by getting vaccines into arms. The federal government has failed miserably at that job. We know that there's not enough Canadian uh, manufacturing that is being done to shore up our own vaccines. So now we're trying to get vaccines from other countries. Many of those shipments have been delayed right. and lives are being lost because of them. So I am upset by what has taken place in Ontario, but I do look back to the federal government and say, had you done your job correctly from the beginning, we wouldn't be in this scenario, in this mess to begin with. Now, that's a very good point. And, and to your point, I, I agree Canada has lagged behind in the G7 nations for vaccine procurement. But some might argue, and, and you know, I might be one of those persons who says, well, hold on, not procuring enough vaccines or, you know, yes, there might be a, there, there is a spike, obviously, in ICU admissions, et cetera. That still is no justification for the violation of civil liberties. You know, one cannot use that to violate our, our civil rights. Or it's, it's not a balancing. And, and again, you know, closing down a playground, how, how the heck is that going to help us contain a virus? Uh, Hannah, you know, I, I was personally concerned with the, the random stop and check by the police, and especially in jurisdictions like Toronto, where we've seen a lot of politicization, especially around the the carding policy. Nobody, many people don't want to go back to those days. And, and here is a reminder of that sort of policy. Were, are these civil violations, these civil rights violations justified? Hannah. No, they're not justified at all. And the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms and the Canadian Constitution Foundation, among other civil li civil liberties groups here in Canada, have been sounding the alarm about this for a long time and have been, you know, they have court cases going on right now. It's only in countries like China and North Korea where there is no regard for human rights that uh, governments can say you can't do X, Y, and Z unless you're vaccinated or unless you're this or whatever. Um, so that is not a, a proper justification. Canadians are stressed out of their minds right now with all these restrictions right. and especially with all of the you know issues with policing and uh, you know BLM and stuff like that. I don't know who is advising Doug for but that's one of the most tone deaf things anybody could do and um, he's making a like a um, worldwide embarrassment of Canada. So many Americans are talking about this now in other countries. They're shocked about the police state we have here in Ontario and BC hasn't learned a lesson now they're going to try this as well and i don't understand how we could have flights coming in uh, from many countries into canada every single day but now we have borders being closed in between provinces i don't see how that's supposed to help right. or make the situation better yeah and just say to that point you know when we start talking about closing borders 100 percent that is the responsibility of the federal government when we have flights that are coming in from nations all across mm -hmm. the planet that shouldn't be happening right now we know that it is and i also want to say 
absolutely under no circumstances is what is taking place with the pandemic a justification to invade people's uh, privacy, to trample on their human rights. However, comparing Canada or Ontario to North Korea, I think is drastic. I, I don't believe we're there. Uh, I think we have seen a government make a decision that was at best tone deaf, which is why it was walked back within 24 right. hours. But again, I'm going to bring us back to the fact that we need this pandemic to be A, under control, and B, finished, over. <laughs> the way we do that is by getting folks vaccinated. And we just do not have enough supply to meet right. the demand. And we're going to discuss this after the commercial break. Specifically, does the end justify the means, especially when we're discussing lower income families? We'll pick this up in just a few short minutes. Welcome back. We're continuing our current issues panel with Hannah Solomon Vey and Vonnie Sweetland. Just before the commercial break, we were going, we're discussing the recent announcement of a lockdown and it's walking back by Premier Doug Ford here in Ontario. You know, there's a big point that I, I've made uh, on social media, and I, I think it's one that has not had enough attention paid to, which is that lockdowns in, uh, significantly and disproportionately impact lower income families. You know, when we talk about the locking down, when children are not in classes, they're doing online learning at home. Well, guess what? Newsflash, not every family has the means or the monetary, has the money to afford a large home where everybody has their own room or bedroom or even an outside space. A lot of lower income Can uh, Canadians or in Toronto specifically live in uh, affordable housing or uh, rent to geared apartments. This kind of lockdown measure, you know, to your point, Hannah, it, it can make people crazy to be cramped up in such a tight space where everybody's doing their own siloing of, of their own learning and, and work. It's a lot. It's a lot to handle. Uh, I was reading a stat from the Toronto Star that said, you know, in, in the Toronto Community Housing Corporation, 154 households have asked to move because of overcrowding. And across Canada, nearly 750,000 households in 2018 report of living in overcrowded homes. You can get seven, 10, sometimes family uh, members living in one two bedroom apartment. How, Vani, I'll ask you, how do you see, I mean, I'm sounding the alarm, but how do you see that uh, the lockdown has disproportionately impacted lower income Canadians? Well, look, we know 100% that it's disproportionately affected BIPOC communities. At the very beginning of this uh, pandemic, the first thing we said was it's affecting communities of color the most. And so we know that there are inequities in healthcare and inequities in a multitude of our other institutions. So now when we start talking about these extreme and intense and very long lockdowns, right. yes, they are affecting people of color. And we've got to remember that a large portion of our essential workers, folks who are on the front lines, our retail workers, our, our hospitality folks, these are people of color. And so they're most likely to be out and about going to work, um, and then coming back home and being forced to be cramped into small quarters. So this is affecting these communities um, in, in a manner that is just not uh, equivocal with everybody else. And I think it's really unfortunate. We've got to start getting ourselves vaccinated so that we can be finished with lockdowns altogether. And I can tell you, as I'm out and about speaking with folks of color, uh, I was in Little Jamaica about two weeks ago, and I talked to a barber there, I talked to a restaurateur, and those types of folks want to get back to regular business. They don't want to sit at home and receive benefits from the government. Right. They view their business as being the source of their livelihood, and they want to get back to it. And that's what we at the CP are trying to do. That is what we intend to do. And it's our job right now to get those messages out so that we can become a party in power and start creating an economic recovery that everybody is going to reap the benefits of. Okay, uh, you mentioned just a few minutes ago uh, about once everybody gets vaccinated, then we, you know, these lockdown measures and masking measures, et cetera, or, or the lockdown can, can be lifted. But we have seen, uh, and we've had uh, medical experts on the show who suggest that, and I think even with the CDC in America that says, you know, vaccination does not inhibit transmission. So transmission could still occur. So maybe I'm being a negative Nancy here. I just don't see any end in sight. If, if the vaccine is not going to stop transmission, then how are we going to ever lift this lockdown? And again, back to the lower income Canadians who uh, 
for those living in 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 apartments or even even not lower income Canadians living in apartments locking down in a, in a cramped quarter like that is is uh, does create a well, mental you, health crisis you look at some places in the united states i mean a lot of people there have been vaccinated they're doing a heck of a lot better than we are here at home and we see people going to baseball games we see people at concerts mm. so i do believe that once we are achieving our goals with respect to vaccination rates, we can get back to some degree of normality. And uh, Hannah, we have seen that in the recent budget announced by the Liberals, that it was revealed that uh, Trudeau has an anticipation by Prime Minister Trudeau that by July, the economy will be opened up because he anticipates 80% uh, vaccination rate. So that's a lot to cover in a few short months. But when we talk about vaccines, we're going to we're gonna dedicate a whole show to this, uh, you know, in the next few weeks. But, you know, let's talk about the vaccine passports. And I'm going to tease the issue, then we're going to go to commercial. But there's a British Columbia fitness gym that said that they're going to be banning new memberships for people who have been vaccinated. They have concerns with the mRNA vaccine, that's the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, and they said as a result, not existing members, but any new memberships will not be issued to those who've had either, uh, who've had an mRNA vaccine. Uh, we're gonna talk about that just when we return from this commercial break. Please stick around. Welcome back. Uh, we're wrapping up our panel here on current issues. And one really stood out for me recently it was a British Columbia gym that said, hey, no new members to our fitness facility who've had an mRNA vaccine. So that's either the Moderna uh, or the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, because they said reportedly there are side effects which are not covered by our liability insurance. So no new memberships for those who've had that vaccine. Hannah, I was surprised to see a headline that this is not in promotion of an, a vaccine passport, but saying if you've had the vaccine, then you're not getting a passport, basically. Uh, what were your thoughts on that? So in general, I'm not a fan of businesses discriminating against people because of you know health reasons. Like we've seen a lot of businesses have created their own policies, not letting people in who are not able to wear a mask or a face shield for medical reasons. Uh, so my thing is that for all the people who've been in favor of uh, businesses, creating their own policies and not uh, and discriminating against people. They have no leg to stand on to say that this, you know, gym should not be able to do whatever they want in this regard. Uh, so when you put yourself in that position, now um, you have a hard time saying that, oh, this is discriminatory now all of a sudden. Um, businesses need to abide by the Ontario Human Rights Code, and that's just a, a simple fact here in Canada. Okay. Uh, Bonnie, I'll give you a quick uh, comment on that if you want, uh, because I do want to get to the carbon tax in a moment. Go ahead. Listen, I, I quite frankly don't have much to add on that same passport at this time. And uh, the reason why I don't is because we haven't seen any policy that's been fully fleshed out. Once it's tangible and in my hand and I can read it, then I'll comment. But um, at this point, I, I have no comment. Okay. I, I do think it's interesting, though, that the justification they're using is to suggest that their insurance liability might not cover them. And I think that's interesting because we do know that the vaccines have had, have bypassed trials, animal trials, uh, in order to get quick access to, to the market. So this is definitely interesting. And I, I think we'll have to keep on top of the story. It's British Columbia. They have a human rights code similar to Ontario. We'll see if this passes. Uh, let's move on to the final topic, and we only have a couple minutes for it, but Aaron O'Toole, the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, has recently announced his version of a carbon tax, but they don't want to call it a carbon tax. They're calling it a, basically a, a collection of money, all this, the, well, I'll let you explain it in a moment, but a low carbon savings account. So first off, this sounds a little complicated. I'm a very, uh, I like streamlined policies, very simple policies. It sounds like a tax. It's less expensive than the liberal tax that they're proposing, but it still seems like a tax. Vani, what are your thoughts? Yes. So you're asking for layman's terms. <laughs> no, I hear you. Uh, look, I'll say this. When we didn't have a policy at the time, we received a lot of backlash from all of Canada, people of every different political stripe. Now we have come forward with something. And of course, we're still being subjected to criticism. I will say this. I've spoken with several leading environmentalists who are very well esteemed, and all of them have told me that they believe a price on carbon is extremely important to adding climate change. Now, in terms of what we've rolled out, the savings account is something that we want to use to have Canadians give themselves to the environment much better than they have before. 
So you can use those savings to get yourself a green vehicle in the future, should that be something you want to invest in HVAC that will bring cleaner energy into your home. It's just a measure that we've taken to do our part in reducing our, our footprint. Okay, but f for for clarity's sake, the members of the party didn't vote for this policy. In fact, there was an attempt to push forward a environmental policy at the recent policy convention in March, and it didn't pass. It, it failed uh, across the board. And, yeah. uh, you know, I think a lot of grassroots conservatives are are shocked. Hannah, we have 40 seconds before we wrap. Do you think this is going to further stoke the fires of Wexit? Uh, they're already feeling a little isolated out in Alberta and British Columbia. How is this going to impact? Do you think this is actually a winning issue for O'Toole heading into potentially a, a summer election? No, it's not a winning thing for Aaron O'Toole. He's going to alienate a lot of conservatives because he ran on a platform that said he was going to scrap the carbon tax that Justin Trudeau had put into place and he would not instate one uh, himself. You can call it a carbon price. You can call it whatever. It's a tax because of taking money out of Canadian taxpayers' pockets. We need to decide for ourselves how we want to spend our money, how we want to make our companies more green, that type of thing. We don't need the government taking away our money and then deciding that they might give it back to us or put it in a bank account or whatever. It's up to us to decide how we want to um, make our companies more green and how we want to spend our own money. It's not up to the government, and this is not a good move for Aaron O'Toole. to be clear, you do have that opportunity. So it's actually up to you to then take those funds from your savings account and disperse them and allocate them to which green efficient uh, products you Okay, you well, do. unfortunately, time's up, but perhaps we'll have you both on and we'll debate this further in the near future. For uh, So thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. I love Current Issues Day. It's always a lively discussion, especially when we have Vani and Hannah on. Well, for CounterPoint, I'm Tanya Granik-Allen.